Welcome back to our special coverage of the U.S. elections now. Even as I speak, America is still at the polls and some of the early results that have been coming in, the projections at this point show that Barack Obama is clearly in the lead. At the moment, he has 103, whereas McCain is currently at 54. Now, these are the projected electoral votes that we're seeing right now. Uh, Obama is projected to have won the state of Pennsylvania, which is a very key state, a key swing state that could have gone either way. Today, America and the world witnessed history. A 47-year-old senator from Illinois defied the odds and the critics by becoming the first African-American in history to be elected the President of the United States. Let's take a look at just how the numbers stacked up. The story of the red and the blues really says it all. Now, this is how the American map looked four years ago back in 2004 when President Bush came to power. As you can see on the screen here, a massive number of states there in red which are the Republican dominated states. Bush came to victory in 2004 by winning 286 electoral votes whereas John Kerry lost that election with 252. Now, Clearly, this is in striking contrast to the results we're seeing today where Obama dominated this map with a larger, significantly larger number of blue states here. But what Obama did right was that he won the key swing states, which in this case is that of Ohio, of Florida, and of Pennsylvania. Whereas uh, in the previous years, these were dominated heavily by the Republicans and these were won by President Bush. Now, Obama safely passed the golden mark of 270 electoral votes by winning these states he ended the tally at 349 electoral votes to McCain's 163 electoral votes it was a victory that was largely predicted by the opinion polls and one which will undoubtedly be forever scripted in history I'm Dalnaz Irani for Times Now Yes, Greg, let's talk a little bit more about Indiana because this is a Republican state. It's voted Republican since 1964. We're seeing it very, very, very tight here. Now, the Obama camp are surely going to be feeling great about the fact that they might not be winning this state, but they're coming very, very, very close to McCain. For sure, uh, Del Nas, they've spent a lot of time and money in Indiana, invested a great deal of their energy there. Uh, uh, obviously, Obama comes from a neighboring state, uh, and he's really tried to show that this is a place where uh, he can make inroads among a kind of white, uh, poorer uh, voter, if you will. Let's just cut back to CBS for a few minutes. Let's get more projections in, and then we'll talk a little bit about the India impact as far as Obama is concerned. So what's really the two sides really looking at? What are they focusing on? What do they hope to get off on a positive start on? Well, right now, the main state that really, you know, is very, very close at this stage is that of Indiana. Now, McCain will be hoping to win Indiana. If Obama does win this state, it will be one of the first upsets on election night. There are four major battleground states that both sides are really, really campaigning for. Now, the first one, and the, the one of the earlier ones to be called, uh, which will come up in, in about an hour from now, is that of Ohio. Now, Ohio Ohio is largely a blue-collar state. Um, it's a state that both candidates have been very, very heavily campaigning. What you're seeing on your screens right now are the four states. So it's Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Florida. Now, these are the four swing states that are really going to be the focus tonight. Right, and now can we understand that in a little while from now, two crucial states that McCain really has to win, Indiana and Virginia, will be closing now. We know that these states have been Republican since 1964, and if he loses these tonight, it could be one of the first upsets of the night what's the mood like there right now and you know uh, in some terms of some of the uh, uh, the results coming in what are the indications right now is McCain likely to win these states well they're extremely close uh, and have been right up to election day uh, but losing those states would be a, a very very serious bowl, blow to the McCain campaign at the end of the day we aren't the reason you came out and waited in lines that stretched block after block well, there you go. That was Barack Obama, who has made history. He is now the first African-American in history to be a Democratic Party nominee, which essentially means he is going to be competing against John McCain in the U.S. presidential elections, and history could be created all over again if this man is made uh, the U.S. president. I'm joined now live from New York with Natasha Israni. Natasha, we just heard Barack Obama. He has declared that he is the Democratic Party nominee, a very jubilant audience there now let me tell you I mean a few months back five months ago when this all began no one really thought that an african-american man would come as far as he has to clinch the Democratic nomination H how has this happened 
Well, it really took Clinton definitely by surprise. Put this in a bit of perspective for us. How important is it for Hillary to officially concede? I mean, until she doesn't concede, where does this still stand? Is she, is she still in the race? Does this give her any bargaining power with Obama? Because we understand Hillary is in a huge amount of debt and there has been talks that she may strike a deal with Obama. Well, there's only one more day left now before election day in America and in these last crucial hours both the presidential candidates Barack Obama and John McCain have been campaigning very hard in the key battleground states of Ohio and Pennsylvania and as the polling begins across the United States the key state to watch out for is Florida in the year 2000 George Bush won the presidential election after winning the state of Florida this time as the population of the state stands divided we try and find out which way the votes could swing well the first of three presidential debates between US presidential candidates Barack Obama and John McCain kicked off today at the University of Mississippi in the United States. And while the two addressed a wide range of issues, the two also talked on the U.S. policy in Pakistan. The axe is hanging over the head of Pakistani President Parvez Musharraf. In a matter of days, Pakistan's coalition government will begin the process to impeach him. Now, some time back, Musharraf had privately communicated that if he didn't think he could thwart the attempt, he may quit Pakistan. Highly placed sources close to the former dictator say Musharraf is already planning his exit. There are several retirement homes the ex-army chief could pick from. The United States. Not only is Musharraf's son Bilal based there, specifically in the Silicon Valley, but President Bush, as a final favour to his ally, may just arrange something for him. Then there's always Saudi Arabia, a favourite home away from home for the world's dictators and discredited politicians. Idi Amin, Saddam's family, Nawaz Sharif are just a few names that spring to mind. Besides, Musharraf had good ties to the House of Sword and is known to have a lot of money stashed away in the country. Well then there's always Turkey. Musharraf grew up there. He also idolised one-time dictator Kemal Ataturk and has good ties to the leadership. As of now at least, publicly, Musharraf is shooting down any rumours of his fleeing Pakistan. But then, History has shown that Musharraf is more than capable of saying one thing and doing something completely different. I'm Delnaz Irani for Times Now. There haven't been crowds like this in Sydney since the 2000 Olympics. More than 125,000 people from all over the world have shown up here for World Youth Day. It's not surprising then, given the large scale of this event, that 39 Indians have gone missing. However, authorities suggest there's something more sinister at play here, that these Indians aren't missing at all, but they're a part of a larger immigration scam, staying back in New Zealand and using this event as an excuse to do so. The Australian Department of Immigration refused to comment on camera about their investigations into the case of the missing Indian pilgrims. They did, however, issue a written statement saying they're looking into the matter along with their New Zealand counterparts. They won't reveal any details of the case because of the sensitive nature of the issue. Most of the Indians that I spoke to here seem largely unaware of the 39 other Indian pilgrims that are apparently still missing in New Zealand. Now, with this event wrapping up in the next couple of days, it's highly unlikely that those Indians will ever even make it to Australia. But in case they do, authorities are on high alert. In Sydney, Australia, I'm Delnazi Rani for Times Now. For the last week, New Zealand immigration authorities have been on an all-out search for 39 Indian pilgrims who went missing on their way to World Youth Day in Sydney, Australia. Today, three of those Indians have surrendered to New Zealand immigration authorities. And I have them here with me to tell me their side of the story. How did you find out that you were a part of an immigration scam? ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਆਏ ਸੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਹੀ ਕਿ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਨਾ 